In 1999, Capcom began development of a prototype for a new Resident Evil game for the PlayStation 2. The game was initially planned to feature Leon S. Kennedy, who would explore the origins of the Umbrella Corporation as well as the T-Virus itself. The game's development underwent significant changes over the next few years, with various iterations and ideas being explored. The game's director, Hideki Kamiya, finally solidified the game's concept to be a cool, over-the-top stylish action game. As development neared its end, the game's producer, Shinji Mikami, successfully lobbied his team and Capcom that this new game had strayed so far from Resident Evil's survival horror roots that it should become its own game. This title would be released on August 23, 2001 as Devil May Cry. With the prototype failing to produce a Resident Evil sequel, teams inside Capcom tried again in 2001. This time, Leon would be tasked as a member of the elite group Anti-Umbrella Pursuit and Investigation Team to raid the castle of Oswald E. Spencer, Umbrella's CEO. Umbrella's rival company ultimately crashes the party after sending a bioorganic weapon called Black Fog, leaving Leon infected with a retrovirus and as the sole survivor of his team. During his exploration of the castle, Leon would run into a young woman who had been subjected to experimentation inside the castle's laboratory, guarded by her bioorganic weapon Dog Companion. Shinji Mikami would tap Nintendo's new hardware, the Nintendo GameCube, as its focus console for this attempt at Resident Evil 4. As work on the game progressed, developers started to run into hardware limitation issues for the game's showpiece Black Fog. Envisioned as a floating mass of tentacles, even with the move to the more powerful Nintendo GameCube hardware, this proved too much for it to handle. The team quickly decided to rewrite the story to feature hallucinatory enemies rather than Black Fog. As a result, the previous story would be donated to another internal Capcom team, it would be the basis for the game Haunting Ground, which would be released in early 2005. Not much is known from this hallucination version of Resident Evil 4. It's reported that the game would have required the GameCube to load two versions of each room in order to transition between the hallucination and normal versions. This would again prove too much. A gameplay concept of this version of the game was presented at the Electronic Entertainment Expo in 2003. In late 2003, Resident Evil 4's concept was changed again, but for the last time. Back to the concept of zombie-like enemies threatening Leon's survival. But instead of the slow shuffling zombies of series past, these would be different. These zombies would run, climb, and viciously pursue Leon, heightening the action and the tension. Now this time, Leon S. Kennedy is a U.S. government agent tasked to rescue the president's daughter who has been kidnapped by a mysterious cult called Los Illuminados. His mission takes him to a rural village in Spain where he finds himself surrounded by the Ganados, a group of people who have pledged themselves to the cult. Unfortunately for Leon, these simple farmers have been infected by a mind-controlling parasite called Las Plagas and will stop at nothing to ensure that Leon fails in his mission. Resident Evil 4 would release on the GameCube on January 11th, 2005. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like. If you're new to Pixels and Pints, subscribe and fill in the bell as well to be notified of new videos as they drop. So Resident Evil 4 is a large departure from the games that came before it. Prior games relied on pre-rendered CG backgrounds, fixed camera angles, and a limited range of motion from which to attack and take down the zombies threatening your survival. Leon S. Kennedy's experience in Spain is presented in a fully rendered 3D world with a close over-the-shoulder perspective. You won't have the luxury of a reticle, but Leon's guns all have laser sights, which enable him to accurately place fire on any enemy combatant. From headshots that stun, which open them up for a nice roundhouse kick, shooting the legs out from under enemies, to targeting weapons being held by the Ganados or shooting a flying projectile heading towards your face. The number of ways you can approach any combat situation has dramatically multiplied, allowing you to approach it in whatever way you see fit. A mysterious merchant will become your friend and a welcome sight, allowing you to upgrade your weapons attack power, ammo capacity, reload and fire times. You'll also have the opportunity to purchase newer and more powerful weapons, as well as inventory slot upgrades and a limited amount of first aid sprays. You'll have to find the rest of your items. Your inventory is still limited. Outside of your knife, every gun, herb, and box of ammo take up precious space. There's also no long-term storage available as in previous games. You either use it or lose it. Resident Evil 4 also isn't shy about throwing hordes of enemies your way either. Ammo can seem plentiful, but you still need to be wise about placing your shots. Liberally spraying bullets can leave you in situations where you're forced to shoot it out with a less than ideal weapon. The best course of action is sometimes just making a run for it. Luckily, you are given plenty of options to make your escape. From ducking into houses, barricading doors, and jumping out of windows, there are a myriad of ways for you to put distance between you and the running hordes trying to tear you apart. Resident Evil 4's gameplay loop will be instantly recognizable to veterans of the series. While the number of loading zones has decreased, you still find yourself in bite-sized portions of an overall location within a larger map. In order to make forward progress, you'll need to solve puzzles, locate key items, and sometimes have a shootout. You'll be actively pursued by anything still alive in your location, with only a temporary reprieve being found by opening a door that requires loading into a new area. Just hope you don't have to backtrack. Early on in your playthrough, you're going to run into the president's daughter, Ashley Graham, who Leon is tasked with saving. Now you're not just focused on ensuring that Leon survives until the end of his adventure, you must ensure Ashley does as well. 
She'll be in the line of fire and at risk of being whisked away by an enemy resulting in Leon failing his mission. Leon cannot proceed very far without Ashley by his side. Luckily you can give her some basic commands that help make her survival easier, but keeping an eye on her is crucial. Another modern addition, well at least 2005 modern to the Resident Evil series, is the introduction of quick time events. You either need to mash a button or successfully press two buttons randomly selected from two different button sets. Failure results in significant damage being taken, or in some cases instant death. This feels harsh the first few times it happens, but you start to realize that the game doesn't punish you very hard for missing them and seems to almost expect all new players to fail some of them the first time around. Boss fights also have a puzzle element associated with them. You can try filling them with bullets and while you can be successful with that approach, you usually find yourself low on ammo and health items as a result, maybe even a fate worse than death. The game's level design is very well done, providing you with multiple pathways to approach a situation, some more efficient than others, these are things you'll learn only by experiencing the game yourself and maybe even dying a few times. Your first time around, this experience will run you about 15 hours in order to reach the end. For those of you who enjoy side content, a first time playthrough will probably run closer to 20 hours as you search out blue medallions, hidden treasures, and become an expert at the shooting gallery minigame. For this review, I played the Resident Evil 4 HD release through Steam. This version offered a few upgrades over the original GameCube version, but is otherwise similar. Clarity is vastly improved over the console versions, but I also got a sense that some of the assets and effects used in the game were very clearly intended for the GameCube hardware and the CRT television of the time. You can play this game at 60 frames per second, which doesn't seem correctly supported either. From what I gathered, a lot of the quick time events are actually harder when played at this high of a frame rate since whoever did the port didn't take the higher frame rate into account. Animations are very well done. The game really loves to transition to in-game cutscenes even during the middle of intense chase sequences. It's very cinematic and appreciated. The models during these cutscenes also get punched up a bit in order to dress up these moments compared to the normal visuals you'll experience while in control of Leon. The way Ganados react differently when being shot in different parts of their body is actually incredible. Shooting one in the feet knocks them to one knee and then another will make them fall back. The animations are obviously canned and reused without any variations, so it can be somewhat comical if you use the TMP to spray the floor in front of a horde and watch them choreograph the same movements, but the moment to moment feeling is still satisfying. Also, maybe this is a hot take, but I really like the film grain the game adds on top of everything. I'm sure it was meant to add a scratchy film horror aesthetic originally, but at modern resolutions and screen sizes, it helps to soften a rather razor sharp image and also hides the fact that the game lacks a ton of fine detail, which is understandable given the hardware constraints this game was built around originally. Regardless, I didn't have any real issues during my time with the game outside of some stuttering, and I think I tracked that down to being a result of this port being unable to utilize more than 2 gigabytes of RAM. If you're unable to deal with how old this game looks in 2023 or beyond, there are alternatives. The RE4 HD project contains a graphical overhaul as well as other various tweaks and fixes in order to improve the visual experience of the current HD release on Steam. If you're just interested in dealing with some of the technical issues involved in playing with newer hardware, there is a separate patch called RE4 Tweaks, which provides the ability for the game to utilize 4GB of RAM instead of 2, as well as enabling things such as a Vulkan renderer in order to provide a better experience on newer hardware. I'll leave links in the description below to both of these downloads if you'd like to apply it to your instance of the game. Musically, Resident Evil 4 hits all of the notes correctly to instill a sense of dread during your playthrough. Long, sharp, metallic notes drone up and down the scales, swelling, contracting, and oscillating in nightmarish ways to maintain your sense of unease as you navigate around certain death creeping around every corner. There are a few tunes that give you a slight reprieve on your journey. You'll quickly recognize these serene notes as a safety line, allowing you to unclench your jaw and relax your body if only for a short time. Audio-wise, the game retains a very Resident Evil sound profile. You'll be familiar with a lot of the UI noises and sound effects. Guns sound great, satisfying clicks and booms. Shotguns especially sound mean. Melee weapons thrown at you cut the air and whiz by, making you brace for impact. Bullets finding their mark create satisfying, wet, impactful noises. Explode ahead and you'll hear a sickening, mushy explosion. Ambience is decent. The environments themselves are very quiet with a handful of noises, whether they be from animals crackling fires, the sound of your own footsteps, a wolf howl, or crickets chirping in the darkness. There is a sense of isolation when there's not much actively happening, which can lend to you being maybe too much at ease. The stark contrast when a Ganado you didn't know was there tears through the silence alerting everyone nearby that you've been spotted makes you shift gears to the point of panic, making you wonder what you walked into. Vocally, this game is hard to really judge since we're going on nearly 20 years since its original release. The voice acting is campy, cheeky, with terrible accents and even more terrible Spanish. It lives in the early era of video games where voice acting was just starting to hit its stride. It's easy to forget that this game was released on Nintendo's first non-cartridge based system and would eventually reach the PlayStation 2 which had transitioned from CDs to DVDs 
vastly increasing the amount of space developers could utilize for things such as long-form dialogue sequences. The Spanish spoken by the Ganados is stilted, grammatically awkward, but at the same time charmingly elementary. It straddles the line of being in a foreign land where you don't speak the language but know a few keywords like matar. So you go, oh, they want to murder me. That's not good. Do I think they could have done better? Yes. Do I think it makes a difference in the overall scheme of the game? No. I love the idea that Capcom wanted you to feel like a fish out of water and being yelled at in a hostile manner in a language that you probably don't understand helps sell that idea. So now for the rest of my thoughts. As a veteran PC gamer, by the time this title was released in 2005, I was already intimately familiar with what's now considered a modern control scheme. Your left hand controlled back and forth and strafe left and right, while your right hand aimed your reticle while also directing your forward movement. So when I say that it was jarring that Resident Evil 4 still maintained tank controls with a touch of modern aiming mechanics, I'm actually understating the experience. There's a steep learning curve and a sense of helplessness as you watch a scythe fly through the air directly at your head and your instincts basically have you turning circles in place. That said, the control scheme is built into the gameplay experience. The Ganados are swift and watching them run towards you is frightening, but as you learn their habits, you realize that by design they stop short a distance away and then begin to slowly walk up to you. Most things that are out to kill you have slow and deliberate movements, but now that Leon himself is more nimble, this is the game compensating so that you're forced to deal with them on Capcom's terms. The point being, Sometimes it's best to shoulder check enemies instead of attempting to do a wide circle around them. You'll learn to quickly adapt to the clunky tank controls. The dedicated key that lets Leon do an about face also helps when you find yourself facing the wrong direction. Moral of the story, if you find yourself in a dangerous situation, just run. You'll quickly realize that most swipes the enemies take are designed to just miss you. Hesitation is probably the most dangerous thing you can do in Resident Evil. The game is also built around tons of small, individual experiences during each of the three major sections of the game sometimes an experience within an experience. While saving often is advised for newcomers, be aware that the game also has a generous checkpoint system. You will die. It will feel unfair, but recognize that it's only Capcom being cheeky, and it's mostly a bit of a nod and wink aimed at the player. You're not meant to fall victim to the same thing twice. Boss fights are similarly designed. The first time you face a boss, you're going to be mentally unprepared, and it will feel chaotic and unfair. That said, if you're quick on your feet and are able to suss out the mechanic that Capcom would like you to utilize rather than a full frontal assault, it's actually pretty damn satisfying to completely dominate the situation. The only exception, Del Lago. That boss is just terrible all around. As I discussed earlier in the review, the Ganados tend to run to your location before stopping and then slowly walking up on you. What I didn't mention as part of my animation discussion was this crazy animation Ganados perform if you really punch through them with a roundhouse kick or a powerful weapon blast. They perform this glorious, over-the-top, corkscrew aerial maneuver before finally landing in a heap on the ground. This has to be an obvious homage to arcade light gun games such as Sega's House of the Dead. This really helps to highlight that Resident Evil 4 isn't out to take itself overly serious despite the intense and heavy themes found throughout the game. Once I learned to roll my eyes at Capcom's cheekiness and acknowledge that they weren't trying to be mean or punish me for playing the game, I learned to not take death in the game too personal. You have to roll your eyes and just say, you got me, and then proceed to crush it the next time around. Resident Evil 4 2005 is available almost everywhere. Retro gamers can pick up the original on the GameCube and PS2, as well as a PC port that I'm not even too sure still exists. Resident Evil 4 HD was released digitally for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, which should still be purchasable as of this date of the video. Japan got a Biohazard Revival Selection physical release in Japan that includes the Japanese version of Resident Evil 4 HD as well as Code Veronica for both PS3 and Xbox 360. The Nintendo Wii received a unique port which enables players to use the Wiimote to perform aiming duties. Resident Evil 4 HD was again released on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One as well as Steam. I think that's all of them. You can pick it up relatively cheap on any of these platforms. And finally, a remake of Resident Evil 4 is being released on March 24th, 2023. So consider this a part one of two in the review of Resident Evil 4, as we'll be doing a follow-up video to discuss the greatness of the remake and break down the differences for those of you joining the party a little late. If you made it this far, thank you for sticking with me during this review of Resident Evil 4 HD. I want to hear your thoughts about it. Did you play this game when it originally launched on the GameCube and PS2? How was your experience if you played it on PC? Was it just as frustrating for you as it was for me? Let me know in the comments below, I'd love to talk to you about it. As always, Thank you for spending your time with us, and I hope to see you at the next video on Pixels and Pine.